Welcome to Nature Journaling, the Art of Curiosity. I'm Hannah Sheehan, an artist and educator here in Springfield. I'm very excited to be with you today and thankful to the Springfield Green County Library for asking me to create this video. This workshop is an introduction to nature journaling, covering everything you need to get started. I first discovered nature journaling a couple years ago, around the time I started plein air painting or painting on location in natural settings. That probably sounds like the same thing, but there are some key differences between plein air painting and nature journaling. In plein air painting, we look for scenic vistas and try to create an appealing work of art. In nature journaling, the emphasis is not so much on the finished product, but on the process of observation, and we often focus on something as small as one plant or even one seed. The most important difference is that no prior artistic experience is necessary for nature journaling, and you can build a great nature journaling practice with a minimal kit of supplies. Let's talk about what you'll need in order to start a nature journaling practice. And it's actually quite simple. You just need a sketchbook and a pencil. This is your basic starting kit. And I'm not bothered about what kind of sketchbook you get or what kind of pencil, it really doesn't matter. The only technique that you need to know how to do with this pencil is getting light areas with light pressure and dark areas with heavy pressure. And the same thing for your lines, light lines versus dark lines. And that's it. And you're gonna see how versatile these two tools really are as I show you some of my pages. So this was all pencil on this page. And as you can see, I've got these light value areas up here, dark ones here and lightweight lines and dark lines over here. And that draws attention where I want it in the sketch. Over here, these were done with a ballpoint pen, which can do a lot of the same techniques and get you a lot of the same values. I was following a tutorial by John Muir Laws. This is another simple, just pencil sketch. And two more. Eventually though, you're gonna say, the world is really colorful and I wanna get some color on my pages. And for that purpose, my favorite lightweight way of doing that is to use watercolor. And we're going to talk some more about this in our last video, but I do recommend just using three colors and seeing how much mileage you can get out of them. And it's a yellow, a magenta, and a cyan. Those are the watercolor primaries. If you do get started in watercolor, I recommend using a metal box to hold them and a clip with a magnet on it, which will not only hold your book pages down so you can work one-handed, but will also hold your palette and keep it from sliding around. It's super handy. And the other tool that makes painting on the go an absolute breeze is a water brush. And a water brush is a synthetic paintbrush that has a hollow handle that you can fill with water so that when you squeeze on the handle, a little bit of water comes out and you can use the brush to pick up the paint, lay it down, and then you can clean your brush just by squeezing out more water. It's so nice to not have to deal with the whole setup of painting on location with water cups and different brushes that you have to keep protected. This one is self-contained and ready to go. And we'll talk some more about that in our last video as well. But for now, just to get you out the door and into the world, making observations and asking questions, all you need is the sketchbook and the pencil. The great thing about nature journaling is that it can be done anywhere there's nature, even the comfort of your own yard. There's no need to go for a long hike in a national park to get the authentic experience, unless you really want to. Personally, I love to nature journal here in Springfield at the Missouri Conservation Society Nature Center. There are beautiful trails and lots of interesting things to draw. Today I'm going to sketch a pawpaw tree, Missouri's native fruit. At least, I think it's a pawpaw tree. Here's the big secret about nature journaling. You're going outside to ask questions, not to answer them in the moment. 
Your nature journal should be the beginning of your research. Anyone can use an app on their smartphone to take a photo of a plant in the wild and find out exactly what it is. Those apps are really useful, but we are outside to connect with nature in a totally different way. The goal is to focus on what we want to find out, not how fast we can reach an answer. In the age of Google, it's really hard to suppress this urge. That's where drawing comes in. We relate differently to what we're seeing when we draw it. Our eyes focus on line and shape, and our brain shifts into a mode that no other activity can access quite the same way. When we try to translate an image from three dimensions to two, we interact with it not as a puzzle to solve or a piece of trivia, but almost like a friend we want to know more about. That sounds a little bit new agey, but suffice it to say that nature journaling is very effective at getting you out of your head and into your environment. Here in my journal, I've started with metadata at the top of my page. The date I'm making these observations and the weather conditions represented by a sun symbol. Late April is a terrific time to start nature journaling when everything is turning green again. But even in the dead of winter, there's always something worth observing outdoors. I'm following the basic lines of this tree's trunk and branches. I could spend hours here going for absolute faithfulness and realism, but I want to focus on the impression. These leaves grow in clumps that hang down like a droopy umbrella. I'm just going for the general shape of them here, but in the next part of this video, I'll do a more detailed leaf study. When I have the layout of my sketch, I like to write down a minimum of three questions in a blank space on the page. Firstly, is this a pawpaw tree? If so, how long until it bears fruit? And finally, what else can be foraged in the woods of Missouri? There's a reason it's called nature journaling and not nature sketching. Writing is also an important part of this process. We're writing our impressions and questions in the moment, not after we've had a chance to think about them or already answer them. There's something just as real and important about messy writing on the page of a nature journal as there is about the sketch. Now I return to add contrast to my sketch. The more vertical trunk is going to be darker in my sketch because it's closer to me and I want to draw attention to it. This is when I use more pressure with my pencil. Some of its branches are turned toward me and some are turned away, so I make them darker and lighter respectively. I'm also adding small dark areas where the leaves meet at the stems because they overlap here and not as much light shines through them. In general, objects that are closer to the viewer are darker and higher in contrast, and objects that are farther away are lighter and lower in contrast. This is known in the art world as atmospheric perspective, and it's a very easy way to make even simple monochromatic sketches like this feel like they have depth. Technically, if I was going for photorealism, there would be leaves all over this sketch, and it would be hopelessly busy. I'm including just a little of the surrounding context of the ground and other plants here. Please don't feel like you have to draw every single thing in your field of view. You can narrow the focus of your sketch as small as you want. My tree study is complete. It's time for one of my favorite topics, watercolor. We all learned in kindergarten that red plus blue equals purple. In practice, if you take stop sign red watercolor and mix it with true blue watercolor, you'll get more of a muddy mauve or even a gray. Not the strong electric purple we're going for if we want to add color to a nature journal entry about a flower. Greens can be equally limited when you mix a yellow with that same blue. You get more neutralized olive tones without the bright springy greens that you want for fresh foliage. With certain media, like the spectrum of visible light, red and blue make a perfectly good purple. But in watercolor, the primary colors are not red, blue, and yellow. They are yellow, magenta, and cyan. This is due to a phenomenon known as color bias. Color bias, the relationship between warm and cool colors and how to avoid making mud on your journal pages, is an entire workshop worth of material on its own. 
but for the purpose of this video, I'm going to demonstrate how to get all the colors you need out of the three watercolor primaries. The three color palette takes all the guesswork out of mixing. If something doesn't look right, just adjust it with one of the other colors to push the tones closer to where you want them. Magenta plus cyan equals deep, vivid purples, perfect for florals and night skies. Yellow plus cyan equals bright, gorgeous greens that can be neutralized with a little magenta for more olive tones. You can even get that stop sign red by adding a tiny bit of yellow to your magenta, or the true blue by adding a little magenta to your cyan. For neutral browns and grays, mix all three colors together and then adjust them as necessary. My little palette is made of Daniel Smith brand watercolors. You can buy them one tube at a time at Michael's here in Springfield. I recommend Hansa Yellow Light, Quinacridone Rose, and Thalo Blue Green Shade. I ordered the empty full pans online and I stuck them inside a mint tin using the kind of sticky tack made for holding up posters. If that sounds like a lot of setup just to start painting, it is. You can get the same mixing results from a watercolor tin that's ready to go right out of the box. It's called the Jane Davenport Brights Palette, and unfortunately it's no longer available in Springfield, but you can still order it online. It includes the three watercolor primaries right up front, plus nine more colors that are especially useful for painting florals. These are student grade watercolors, but they're highly pigmented and you can get great results with this palette. A small palette you can still get locally is the Koi Watercolors Pocket Field Sketch Box. It also includes a yellow, magenta, and cyan that are fairly versatile for mixing, but the Koi paints are much weaker than the Jane Davenport kit, and you'll have to use a lot more paint to get vibrant colors. One important technique when working with watercolor is not to paint in pasto or to put the paint down in clumps on the paper. For one thing, watercolor comes in too small, too expensive packages to paint that way. For another, the beauty of watercolor is the way it lets light through to shine off the paper underneath, and if you lay it down in heavy, opaque strokes, that beauty will be lost. That does not mean you have to paint with washed out, pale colors. By using your palette's mixing surface to dilute the paint on your brush, you can achieve highly saturated tones without sacrificing the qualities that make watercolor so beautiful. You can get the full range of saturation from your paint using a water brush in just one wash or area of color. Start with a highly saturated mix of paint and pull your brush back and forth horizontally across your paper. The water brush uses capillary action to draw water into the bristles, which is the same way plants move water through their roots. This will gradually lighten the color as you paint. You can achieve some wonderful effects this way for painting skies and even flower petals. Some painters refer to the different levels of paint versus water as tea, milk, and honey consistency. Others call it watery, juicy, and pasty. Water control and watercolor is another workshop worth of material on its own. The best way to become familiar with it is to paint a lot and really explore what your tools can do. Now let's do some watercolor in the field. On the facing page in my sketchbook, I have made a light pencil sketch of one group of leaves on one tree. This is going to be a simple color study. However, as I got up close to make my sketch, I realized the color I'd be working with was anything but simple. Cameras will compress colors and might not reflect what I could see with my eye, which was that I would be working with several kinds of green. There's the bright spring green of the tops of the leaves where the sun hits them or shines through them, a darker, richer green where they overlap or are in shadow, and a pale, almost minty green underneath the leaves and on the stems. Fortunately, using the principles of color mixing and water control I've already shown you, I can capture all those greens with my tiny palette. I'm using a sponge to clean my brush in between colors. A favorite tool of many nature journalers is the cuff of an old sock, which they wear on their wrists so their hands are free to paint. 
A trick I've picked up from urban sketch painters is that even when you're doing a detailed study, you don't have to include every detail. If you draw the details in one area, the viewer's brain automatically fills in the rest. I wanted to capture the veins of these leaves, but I also didn't want to be sitting in the sun for four hours drawing every single vein. I selected one set of leaves closest to me in the image, and I drew in their veins and let the rest be just green. This group of leaves all seemed to sprout from one part of the plant that looked to me almost like the leftover petals of a flower. I made a note of that in my sketchbook as well. There was just a tiny touch of pale red at the tips of those petals, so I blended that out toward the pale yellow green closer to the stem. Finally, I mixed all three colors on my palette together to make a neutral brownish gray for the woody part of the stem and the branch it's connected to. Some of these darker green leaves have two layers of paint. That's known as glazing, and it's important to let each layer dry completely before you add another, or you risk making a mess and lifting paint off instead of making it darker and more saturated. This page didn't feel quite complete to me, but a short walk down the trail revealed exactly what I needed. The turtles were out sunning themselves on this beautiful day. There was also a tree branch covered in blossoms in the same view, and that gave a wonderful indication of the time of year, so I decided to use it instead of focusing only on the turtles and the river. Here I am including all these elements in what John Weir Laws calls a landscape edo. A landscape edo is a small, self-contained view on your journal page, with none of the expectations or pressures of traditional landscape painting. You're trying to capture the feel of where you are in the moment, not a technically perfect artistic rendition. In a landscape edo, your lines can be simple and rough, and your color can be expressive. I want to capture the texture of slow-moving water in a light breeze that's reflecting the sky, so I'm scattering small touches of pale blue and giving it a slightly greenish tint as I move upward. There's a lot of greenish brown in this water, but first I'm going to mix the dark brown of the shadows at the base of the turtles in the log and the dark hanging branch in the foreground. Now I go back to my palette to thin that dark brown paint to a more watery consistency, which gives me the right tone for the water. There's more texture on moving water in the foreground than there is in the background, so I use smaller touches of color at the bottom of my sketch and broader flat areas as I get closer to the log. This is a perfectly good place to stop with a landscape edo, and knowing when to stop is also an important skill for a painter. I debated whether to leave it here, but I ended up going with a wash of neutral gray with some blue at the top, just to indicate the bare trees on the other side of the river and the sky showing through their branches. I hope this workshop has inspired you to get outside and document the world around you in your sketchbook. To learn more about nature journaling, I highly recommend John Muir Laws' book, The Laws Guide to Nature Journaling and also his channel here on YouTube, which is full of amazing nature journaling resources. I'll see you in the woods.